We can sometimes uh, <clears throat> think that with all the discussions of the death of God or the end of God or of the modern and perhaps postmodern ambivalence about God, that theology does not have much of a future. After all, if theology is theologos, discourse about God, then its future as a discipline or practice seems questionable indeed. But here, I mean, I've, I'm, so I'm, I'm concerned about time because I did about a day and a half of, of this work in Melbourne on talking about theology as proposal. And so I think I've got about 10 minutes, if I'm lucky, to kind of <laughs> to, to convey this. So I'm going to, right, no pressure, but... Um, what I want us to think about, I'm going to put a little theological map on, again, uh, and this is going to look like a classical theology, so don't, don't be upset by that, but God's going to be above, as it were, and if we had time, this itself is a fascinating kind of experience, what I call mapping theology, but for now, just, let's just look at some topics. So God, in a sense, uh, creates, we can talk about that and all that, God creates world. And here we have this language of image of God, human beings created in the image of God. Right. Then you have this discussion of, of sin. Right. If you're just playing, so you've got a, 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 this affirmation of world. You've got a problem that challenges this affirmation, sin. Then theologically, you've got a proposed solution that responds to the problem of sin and reaffirms however you've interpreted this goodness. This model, your interpretation of Jesus as the Christ is going to respond to this. It's going to reaffirm this goodness. And then there's a kind of if. If, in some sense, this is the proposal character. If, in some sense, one then pro accepts this proposed solution, this interpretation, then what happens is the possibility of a new community. So here you have traditionally language of grace and faith, but the life here is of the church. Here's, here's the proposed solution, and then out of this proposed solution is going to come a new community, and that community, that new community itself is going to open up, whether in the classical model of exitus, there's a new, in the... Uh, in the Middle Ages, exitus and reditus, all things coming from God or going to God, pay no attention to the classical model. You can also say that this idea of church opens up a new sense of the future. The topic here in theology is called eschatology, discourse of the end. But really we can think of it in terms of the future. What one always has to keep in mind is what we've been emphasizing throughout the last couple of days, that however one interprets these topics, right? One is always interpreting them contextually. So these are, the, the perspective is never a pure perspective. It's never one that gets you to presence or certainty, but it's always interpreting and, and these topics in light of changing economic, political, socio-historical circumstances. So keep context in mind. Now what often happens is again the focus is often on this discourse of God in theology. What I am trying to do in my work, and even in this, um, this current work, is to say, actually, if we pay attention to these five topics, right, which is to say, this topic of the image of God, sin, Christology, church, and eschatology, we actually might get to something more interesting, and perhaps even more pivotal to theology. Because when theologians interpret these topics, they are in fact, this is, I'm speaking of systematic or constructive theologians, what they're putting on the table is a proposal for leadership in the church and in the broader community. That proposal is carried in these five topics. And here's how, especially with my students, perhaps with you as well and many others, if I say to you, now today we're going to talk about the topic of sin, and you say, oh my God, do we have to? Right? Or today we're going to talk about Christology, and you say, please, could the wheels touch the ground soon? Because it, you already feel the discourse kind of sweeping over your head. Well, here's the point. Here's my point. 
that each of these five topics in the explicit language of theology, actually, there's a kind of a level of proposal. When you look at these five topics and the way in which they're interconnected, you actually get a discourse of proposal. Here's how. This is, how of, of, this is why I see the overlap between the political and the rhetoric. If I had more time, we would walk through several political speeches so that you could actually see the movement. So here's how it goes. Instead of imago dei, think affirmation. The topic here is what the theologian often first does, is there's a basis of affirming the audience, affirming the goodness of the audience. If you don't believe in the basic goodness of the audience, why are you bothering talking to them, right? I mean, that's, that's a kind of a key rhetorical move. It's not always followed in theology, but in many cases it is. So here's, there's this first move of affirmation. The second move then, you don't have to talk about sin explicitly. Sin is a particular way of talking about what I've called a problem. And in the discourse of philosophy or theology, the problem's a serious one. It's a serious one because it threatens the goodness, this affirmation, however we're interpreting it, right? So if what makes us in the image of God or what affirms us in both a political or a theological sense is that we have a capacity, an openness to difference, right? Then in some ways, the problem would be, the problem there would be, oh, our tendency in ideology to shut down difference into sameness, right? That would be the problem. If we have this open capacity, then we should live out of it. The problem shows up when we become ideologically blind, conventional, self-centered, inward-looking, and we deny that diversity. So also here then in Christology, what you're looking at is a proposed solution. And how, of course, in terms of basic rhetoric, how you interpret one topic shapes the way you interpret these others. But here, in terms of making a proposal, my way is to first to affirm, a kind of, to affirm the goodness of my audience in a contemporary way, to name the problem that threatens us and our belonging, or our understanding of the faith or the political world. Then when I offer a proposed solution, right? then this is going to have to respond to the problem and it begins to open up a new, so in terms of these five topics, affirmation, problem, proposed solution, what's the new community? What's the renewal of community that can happen if we embrace this proposed solution? And this then, so what this is, what I'm finding in my teaching is when I can talk to my students about saying, look, let's read some political speeches, then let's begin to look at the way in which these topics are actually implied both in politics and in theology, they begin to pay attention. Because they're not lost in the fourth century discussion of Christology, now they're trying to locate, hmm, what's that language of proposed solution to the, to the understanding of the problem? What's the new community that comes out of this? And even more important, perhaps, What's the future look like in light of the proposed solution and the dynamic of the new community? Well, I'd love to spend a day and a half with you on this. Perhaps you can invite me back <laughs> to talk about this. Or you can read my book when eventually it gets pub published. My point here is that we treat the topics, human beings creating the image of God, sin, Christology, as oftentimes sui generis, as if they themselves descended from the clouds. And we miss the fact that these theological topics are interconnected in a particular way. And that when theologians interpret these topics, they are developing new proposals for moving communities of faith in new directions. I want us to seize on that. I want to say, this is the heart of theology. Because finally, the way in which you interpret this proposal and you begin to shape a proposal, whether it's to deal with climate change or whether that proposal is designed to deal with racism or some other human problem, right? 
The fact of the matter is that given the coherence of topics, the God language is going to follow the proposal. It's going to be at least implied in the way in which you construct these topics of the proposal. Yeah, yeah. But <clears throat> by focusing there, which is to say on these topics, we come to see that the topic of God is always treated in such a way as to bless or affirm the proposal being made. In fact, the language of God, if one looks at it through the tradition, is not unchanging. It's changing all the time. Right? And in fact, this is where, and we're living through a particularly dynamic uh, period of rethinking the sacred. It's not by chance that Augustine's proposal, which articulates an absolute need to come to one particular faith, as we were discussing this morning, the problem of original sin that can be healed only by baptism in the one church, is shaped by his participation in a now officially Christian empire with an imperial, all-powerful model of God. That's the context that shapes his proposal. Nor is it by chance that just at a time when we are becoming increasingly aware of our responsibility for care of the earth, and theologians are developing proposals for how we acknowledge our responsibility for climate change, for global pollution, that threatens all life on the planet, including ourselves, that they are also reframing the knowledge of science into what Lloyd Gearing calls a new great story. And I think Jason was also use it, utilizing some of that language today. Notice here, in order to become theology, I was making this point a few moments ago, scientific data needs to be interpreted in a way that suggests the earth, the cosmos, is our home, the vast space of our belonging. In Gearing, as well as in Sally McFaig, Keller, and others committed to this new story, one hears the invocation of awe and wonder, which recalls the topic of being created in the image of God, that we are open to the infinite. But here, it's the vastness of the cosmos in which we are at home. It's not a leap outside of the cosmos to an eternal realm, but no, to an embrace of the cosmos in time, in the vastness of space as our home. Sin, or the problem, is how we have turned away from that wonder and have despoiled the earth for which we are now responsible. When I consider this capacity at the heart of theology to offer new proposals, to in a sense take the classical model and blow it out with respect to developing new proposals that are relevant and important for our time, I am heartened by that capacity for renewal within the discipline itself. So I can imagine not only the continuing revisioning of theology along the lines of religious naturalism, but also along the lines of co-mingling religious traditions in new ways, as those forces continue to grow in the coming century. I remember Don Cupid writing in Taking Leave of God about being a Buddhist Christian. George Tinker's Native American theology and other post-colonial theologies are going to develop in ways that call us to reimagine the sacred. And that is an exciting, as well as a daunting challenge. How will theology adap adapt to or address the development of the post-human, which I was raising a bit, I think, last night, the rapid development of technology into the domain of consciousness and technologically modified consciousness. How will theology deal with the loss of jobs due to technology, a question that we can see in the election of Donald Trump, which is a dangerous one, the rethinking of global economics and whether there will be opportunities for those at the margins, the expanding gap between the wealthy and the destitute. These are vast problems, and these are only some of the ones we can imagine. Gearing is right, just as at the beginning of the 20th century, no one could imagine the changes that would occur by the beginning of the 21st. We seem to be opening on to a world that will experience incredible pressures and challenges, as well as profound innovations that will change our basic understanding of what it means to be human. Theology is dangerous business. If language is dangerous business, so also here is theology. Insisting on one version of reality as truth itself, and therefore a force that blocks engagement with real problems, uh, that is at work in Donald Trump and in the audiences to which he appeals. But it can also challenge our conventional assumptions, our default world, our conventional view of reality, as Brandon Scott has spoken of it. 
and call us to the courageous work of building communities that take seriously the abiding call that draws us out of ourselves for the sake of the world and as the banner says, for the sake of the common good. And I'll stop there. Thank you.